been observed that adds a little information to the genome. Now, mutations may increase survival value under certain circumstances, that's fine, but they don't add brand new information to the genome. They don't do that. It would violate the laws of information science. Information science, genetics, they confirm biblical creation. And they're not what we'd expect given the evolutionary worldview. So I think that's a great confirmation of, of creation. We could talk about the biblical time scale and the fact that we find C14 in diamonds. And uh, Dr. Snelling talked about that the other night. I think that's a really powerful confirmation of a young earth because C14 does not last even one million years. If the entire earth were C14 in one million years, it would be gone. It would have decayed into nitrogen. I didn't even believe that calculation until I did it myself. It's true. It, 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 C14 just doesn't last that long. And so the fact that we find in diamonds that are supposed to be billions of years old tells us those diamonds are not billions of years old. They're thousands of years old. In fact, it limits the age at a few, a few thousand years. And that, of course, the 58,000 there is an upper limit. It could be much younger than that. So carbon, or C14 in diamonds, and pretty much everything we find in the earth, anything that has carbon in it has C14 in it, it appears. And that certainly confirms recent creation and a global flood uh, in, in the geologically recent past, not millions of years ago. We could move out into space, talk about comets, the fact that comets are made up of ice and dirt and they orbit the sun, and every time they orbit, they lose a little bit of material. As the sun blasts away that icy material, that's what forms a comet's tail. Of course, we looked at some of those uh, yesterday, those of you that attended my astronomy talk. So comets just don't last that long. They run out of material in about 100,000 years. And I've seen comets be destroyed in one pass as they go behind the sun. I used to have access to the SOHO spacecraft, and it would watch for comets, and among other things. And sometimes they would be destroyed in one pass. They do not last that long. And so if the solar system really were 4.5 billion years old, why do we still have comets? Now, I think these are amazing lines of evidence, don't you? I mean, they're pretty powerful confirmations of biblical creation. But they really don't constitute an ultimate proof. I mean, it may seem like I've refuted the evolutionary worldview, that I've absolutely demonstrated creation, but I haven't. And the reason is, for every one of these lines of evidence that I've presented to you, an evolutionist can always come up with what we might call a rescuing device. He can come up with a conjecture designed to protect his worldview from what appears to be contrary evidence. So in the case of comets, for example, my secular astronomy friends, they know that, uh, they know that comets don't last that long. But they say, well, but the we know the solar system is billions of years old, so there must be some source of new comets, which they call an Oort cloud after its inventor, Jan Oort. And so the idea is there's this vast sphere of potential comets way beyond the planets, beyond where we can detect it. And every now and then, one of these is thrown into the inner solar system and becomes a brand new comet. So as the old ones are depleted, new ones replace them. That's kind of convenient. So you see the solar system can be billions of years old after all. Now, if I were to ask a secular astronomer, do you have any observational evidence of an Oort cloud? If he's honest, he'll say, well, no, but you can't prove it's not there, right? And that's true. I can't prove that there's not an Oort cloud. It's very hard to disprove something that can't be detected in any way. So, so yeah, I mean, that's true. And, and therefore, there could be an Oort cloud. And therefore, comets don't prove that the solar system's thousands of years old. They confirm it, but they don't prove it. And if you think about it, an evolutionist can always invoke a rescuing device because there are always unknowns. We don't know everything. And there are always unknowns in science, and therefore the evolutionists can always invoke a rescuing device. And by the way, so can you. I might ask you a question that you don't immediately know the answer to. You'll come up with a rescuing device. You're not ready to just give up your worldview on the basis of one uns little unsolved mystery there. And so uh, I can't really blame my evolutionary colleagues for inventing the rescuing devices. I'm not blaming the secular astronomer necessarily for thinking there's an Oort cloud. That is consistent with his observation that there are comets and his worldview, his belief that the solar system is billions of years old. So he's thinking in a way that is consistent with his worldview. On the other hand, I don't necessarily believe in an Oort cloud. I don't have any reason to. I look at comets and I say, yeah, that's what I'd expect because I start with a different worldview, a different way of thinking about things. If you think about it, Creationists and evolutionists really all have the same facts, don't we? I mean, I have access to the same DNA patterns. I have access to the same fossils, the same stars and galaxies as my evolutionary colleagues. We have the same facts, the same physical evidence, as it were. We have the same science. I use physics and chemistry and astronomy. My secular colleagues use physics, chemistry, and astronomy. We have the same science. Why then do we draw such different conclusions about the past? And the answer is we have a different starting point, a different worldview a different way of thinking about things, which you can liken into mental glasses. 
Those of you that wear glasses, you know that if you have those off, the world looks fuzzy. You put those glasses on, the world snaps into focus, and you see things as they are. And I like to think of the Bible like corrective lenses. You think, you think about things from the perspective of biblical history, you see the world as it is. I like to think of evolution like uh, red glasses. You put on red glasses, the world looks red. Not that the world is red, but that's what you see, because you see it's biased because of your, uh, your, the glasses you're wearing. Now, I realize, of course, evolutionists will say, oh no, we're the ones wearing the corrective lenses, you're the ones wearing the red glasses, and we're gonna have to argue for that. My point here is simply that we all wear mental glasses. We all have a worldview. We all come to the evidence with, uh, with certain preconceptions, with certain beliefs about how that evidence should be interpreted. Now, some people might say, oh no, not me. I don't have a worldview. I, come to the, I believe we ought to come to the evidence neutrally and objectively. Well, guess what? That is a belief about how to interpret evidence. See, the philosophy that we should come to evidence without a philosophy is itself a philosophy. <laughs> it's just a very bad one because it's self-refuting. Your worldview is all of your most basic beliefs about reality, which we call presuppositions. Presuppositions, your most basic beliefs about the universe, about how we know what we know, and so on and so forth. They are the rules of interpretation that we assume at the outset before any investigation of evidence. Before you do an experiment, a scientific experiment or otherwise, before you do anything, you already have certain beliefs about how the universe works. You already have certain presuppositions. For example, the belief that your senses are basically reliable. You take that for granted, that what you see and taste and touch and smell and so on really corresponds to the actual universe. You couldn't do an experiment on a rock if you didn't already believe that. You'd look at the rock and you'd say, well, just because I see it doesn't mean it's necessarily there. So there's no point in doing an experiment on it. You presuppose that your senses are basically reliable. That your memory is reliable is a presupposition. You believe that what you remember actually happened, right, for the most part. Now, if I asked you, how do you know that your memory is reliable? You say, oh, well, Dr. Lyle, that's easy. I took a test two weeks ago. I did very well on it. It was a memory test. Excuse me, how do you know you took a test two weeks ago? See, just because you remember it doesn't mean it happened unless you already presuppose that your memory is reliable. Or lo laws of logic are presuppositions. The fact that uh, the law of non-contradiction, you can't have A and not A at the same time in the same relationship. That is a presupposition. You couldn't begin to reason about things unless you already took it for granted that there are laws of logic. That's a presupposition. Now here's the key. Creationists and evolutionists have different sets of presuppositions, different worldviews, different rules for interpreting the evidence. And that's very important to understand because the battle really isn't about evidence. It's about how evidence ought to be interpreted. And we have different standards by which we interpret the evidence. Now for the creationist, the Bible is the ultimate standard by which evidence should be interpreted. I'm not saying that all creationists do have the Bible as their ultimate standard. I'm saying they should. The Bible should be our ultimate standard in reasoning. Now I have secondary standards as well. I do believe that my senses are basically reliable. But that's not my ultimate standard because I know my senses can be fooled. You take a beam of wood, for example, and put it in water at an angle, and it looks like the wood bends when it goes under the water because of the way the light refracts. Now, you don't believe your eyes in those circumstances, do you? You don't believe the wood actually bends just because you see it, because you have a greater standard that solid things stay, so stay solid even under water and under most circumstances. You have greater standards than that. And ultimately, it will come back to an ultimate standard, which I argue ought to be the Bible. The Bible should be our ultimate standard. What about the evolutionist? What is his or her ultimate standard? Well, it actually depends on which evolutionist you ask, because there's not one single evolutionary worldview, but, but commonly naturalism is the ultimate standard for the evolutionist. The, the natu naturalism is the belief that nature is all that there is. There's nothing beyond the natural world. If it cannot be explained by physical processes, it doesn't exist. And then there is also empiricism. That's another ultimate standard that might be used by, by many evolutionists. And sometimes they believe in a combination of these two. But one of them is obviously more ultimate than the other. Empiricism is the belief that all truth claims are answered by observation. If you want to know something, you go out and look. Go out and do an experiment. That's how you answer all truth claims. Of course, I believe many truth claims are answered that way, but not all of them. Let's talk about evidential arguments. And by that, I mean an argument that, that, leaves, that, that attempts to leave worldviews out of the discussion and simply talk on the basis of individual evidences. Uh, evidence by itself, however, will not resolve a worldview conflict. Why is that? Because your worldview tells you what to make of the evidence. You see, that's, 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 why, that, uh, that's why evidence by itself is not going to resolve anything. It's not decisive. It's not that people don't have enough evidence for creation. The Bible tells us everyone has enough evidence for the Creator God in Romans 1. Everybody knows that. The problem is they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And, and God tells us there's no excuse for that. So it's not that people don't have enough evidence. 
their, their presuppositions tell them what to make of that evidence. And I want to give you a silly example just to drill this home. There was a man who was convinced that he himself was dead. He thinks he's dead, and he's very upset about this. He doesn't like being dead. Who would? And his doctor is trying to convince him, look, fella, you're, you're perfectly healthy. I mean, you know, you, you're not dead. You're, you're walking and talking. And the guy thinks about it, and he says, yeah, but, you know, people can have muscle spasms even after clinical death. That could explain my ability to walk and talk. And the doctor says, but look, I have medical charts showing you're perfectly healthy. And the guy says, yeah, but, you know, who knows if that's, who knows if you're interpreting that properly? And uh, in any case, uh, maybe that's not even my chart. Maybe the name got swapped. And the doctor says, okay, I, I'm going to prove to you that you are not dead. Do dead men bleed? The guy thinks about it for a second. Oh, the circulatory system would be stopped. No, dead men don't bleed. And, and the doctor very quickly takes a little pin, pricks the guy in the hand. Sure enough, blood comes to the surface. The doctor says, see, you're bleeding. To which the man responds, well, how about that? I guess dead men do bleed. <laughs> Silly example, but it, it illustrates the point. Did, did the doctor have evidence for his position? Absolutely. The guy could walk and talk. He had medical charts. The guy could bleed. Did the man find those evidences convincing? No. Because he had a worldview. He had a presupposition that he himself was dead. And that presupposition told him how to interpret each one of those evidences. He was always able to come up with a rescuing device. And a clever person always will come up with a rescuing device. That's why you can't just throw evidence at people and expect them to change their worldview. There's no, there's no obligation for them to do so. They're just going to interpret that evidence accordingly. That's why you can't just, people don't just need more reasons to believe. That's not a logical or biblical approach to apologetics. They need to have their worldview challenged. That's what we want to do. Now, you may have very good evidence for creation. You might say, see how this is evidence that the Bible is true? And maybe it's very good evidence that confirms creation. I'm to think fossils are very good evidence that confirm the worldwide flood. Don't get me wrong. But that's because I'm looking at it properly through biblical glasses. My secular colleague is going to look at that same evidence through secular glasses, and what's he going to say? He's going to say, that's not how I see it. That's not how I see it. He's going to come up with a rescuing device to account for that evidence according to his worldview. And to add insult to injury, he's going to say, actually, you're the one coming up with the rescuing devices. My explanation is the right one. And so, and so we think, oh, well, maybe that's not a good evidence. Let's try something else then. What about canyon formation? See, canyons can form quickly. And he says, well, maybe that one did, but how do you know that the Grand Canyon formed quickly? You don't know that. Oh, but, but well, we need another evidence then. Look how rock layers can be deposited quickly. So, well, Mount St. Helens proved that. And he said, well, maybe those ones can form quickly, but how do you know that all of them have formed that way? Maybe some of them are slowly over billions of years. Oh, but, but you see, animals, they, they reproduce according to their kinds. That's what we'd expect. He says, well, maybe they do today, but given enough time, one kind can change to another. Oh, but, but DNA, you know, DNA has information in it. It never comes about by chance. And he says, well, maybe there's some unknown mechanism that produces it. Give us time, we'll find it. Oh, but, you know, there's comets out there. They don't last billions of years. Oh, but there's an Oort cloud, he says. Now, it's not wrong to show people that, that there's evidence that is consistent with God's Word and confirms that. In fact, I think there's value in that. But evidence by itself is never decisive because you always require a worldview to tell you what to make of that evidence. Therefore, a philosophically astute person will not be persuaded by mere evidence. And that's probably worth getting in your notes. A philosophically astute person will not be persuaded by mere evidence. Why? Because if he's clever, if he's philosophically astute, if he's sticking to his worldview, he's going to come up with a rescuing device for every evidence that you present. You see, and so he's not going to be persuaded one way or the other. Evidence by itself is not decisive because a person's presuppositions tell him what to make of the evidence. And why is it we have a difficult time with this? Well, I think part of it is we tend to spend a lot of time with people that have the same worldview that we do, and therefore they are inclined to interpret the evidence the same way, and so we can change their mind on something by presenting new evidence. If you and I had a disagreement about whether or not there are crackers in the pantry, we can settle that disagreement by going over to the pantry, opening it up, and see if there are crackers there. And we should be brought to the same position based on this evidence because we have the same worldview. We already agree on the rules of interpretation. And so, yeah, you see, see the crackers? There, there they are. I was right. And so you're, we're, our beliefs are brought into alignment. But if I'm having that same discussion with a Hindu who believes that this universe is illusion because Hindus have a monistic worldview, they think this, this world is all illusion, and I show him the crackers, he's going to be convinced? No, he's going to say that's an illusion too because he's got a different worldview. You see, evidence is not decisive when it's a worldview discussion. And origins, guess what, is a worldview discussion. And so we need to keep that in mind. And the problem with many creationists today and virtually all evolutionists is that they argue as if their opponent had the same worldview they do. And they get very frustrated because they, don't, they say, why don't you understand that this evidence proves my point? 
Well, we need to think in terms of worldviews. We cannot argue that our worldview is right because of the evidence, because our worldview tells us how to interpret that evidence. And I hope that that is clear. Somehow we need to show that our standard is the correct standard. How are we going to get anywhere then? I'm over here standing over on my uh, biblical presuppositions. My secular friend is standing on his secular presuppositions. How are we going get to get anywhere in this debate? Let me give you the wrong answer before I give you the right answer, because good teachers always do that, right? They give you the wrong answer first. Well, the wrong answer is this, and a lot of times evolutionists will say, well, let's meet here on neutral ground. He says, he says maybe there are some presuppositions we can agree upon, and maybe those, you know, we can, we can abandon the other ones, and one of the ones you have to abandon is that the Bible's the Word of God, he says, because I certainly don't believe that. So leave the Bible out of the discussion. We both agree science is useful, so let's just talk in terms of science on neutral ground. Now, what's the problem with neutral ground? There is no neutral ground, right? Jesus says, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Romans 8, 7, the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. Does that sound neutral to you? Hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. There's no neutral. You're either God's friend or his enemy. You're for him, you're against him. You're gathering, you're scattering. There's no neutral ground when it comes to a worldview. We all have a positive worldview. And so we're going to call the attempt to be neutral, the pretended neutrality fallacy. And that's what it is. It's a fallacy. Since the Bible indicates that there is no neutral, the claim of neutrality is itself unbiblical. Does that make sense? If you, see, the Bible says there's no neutral. So if you say, oh, yes, there is neutral, and I'm neutral, you've just said the Bible's wrong, in which case you're not being neutral. You're taking a position that the Bible's wrong. So neutrality is a non-neutral position, and so is immediately self-refuting. And so if, if this person says, well, yeah, let's meet here on neutral ground, leave the Bible out of the discussion because we don't agree on that. We'll just, we'll just take things that we agree on. And if you say, yeah, okay, we can leave the Bible out of the discussion, no problem. Well, neutral ground is really secular ground because the Bible says there's no such thing. And if you agree to his terms for the debate, really, you've lost. Because isn't the debate about biblical authority? We're trying to show this person the Bible is absolutely right in everything it says. And he says, okay, but let's start the debate by meeting on neutral ground, which the Bible says there isn't. And you say, okay, you've started the debate by assuming that the Bible's wrong. How are you going to get to the position that the Bible's true? Right? You, you can't, you can't uh, defend biblical authority by abandoning biblical authority. That doesn't make sense. You've started the debate by conceding defeat. That is not a good way to start a debate. <laughs> Two things to remember when people ask you to be neutral. Because the secularists, they like to think that they're neutral and they're gonna want you to be neutral too. Two things to remember when people ask you to be neutral. One, they're not. Two, you shouldn't be. (laughs) No one is neutral when it comes to a worldview issue, and you shouldn't attempt to be neutral when it comes to a worldview issue. You can't be anyway. No one can approach evidence without presuppositions, and if they think they are, that's a presupposition. We're to, we're to stand on the word, hold fast the word, both to exhort and sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. We stand on the word while defending it. Now, some evolutionists, well, and even some creationists will say, well, you can't do that because that's circular reasoning. You can't stand on the Bible while defending it. But you know, I don't see any intellectual reason why you can't. In battle, you can stand on a hill while you're defending the hill, right? You, if you ever had something in your eye, and you go to a mirror, and you can, you can, you know, look in the mirror like that, you can use your eye to examine your eye and correct your eye. And so it's not, it's not a vicious circle to uh, stand on the Word of God while defending it. And by the way, the evolutionist stands on evolution while he's defending it anyway. So think about that. It's not, it's not fallacious. Now, I will deal, deal with this charge of circular reasoning more, um, more cogently, perhaps, in a later session, but it's not, it's not a vicious circle. Well, how then do we get anywhere? Because I'm standing on my biblical presuppositions. I'm not leaving those. I'm not going to try to meet on neutral ground. There's no such thing. My secular colleague is standing on his presuppositions. How do we get anywhere? How are we going to resolve the debate? Is it possible? Yes, it is. And this is really what the ultimate proof of creation is all about. The biblical presuppositions, it turns out, and only biblical presuppositions, make knowledge possible. They make it possible for us to know things. They make science possible. And the Bible tells us as much. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want to begin to know something? You've got to start with God, biblical presuppositions. And there's a flip side to this. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. You reject the biblical God, you reject his presuppositions, you're reduced to absurdity, foolishness, the Bible calls it. 
because all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are deposited in Christ. All knowledge is in God. So if you want to know anything, it's got to be through God, through biblical presuppositions. Now, there is an immediate objection to this because a lot of people will say, well, wait a minute, Dr. Lyle. Non-Christians, they do know some things. They do have knowledge. That's true. But you see, non-Christians do know in their heart of hearts the biblical God. And they do rely upon biblical presuppositions when it suits them. They don't do it consistently, but they do rely on biblical presuppositions. Therefore, they are able to know things. Putting it another way, only the Bible makes knowledge possible. So the fact that un unbelievers do know things, all that does is prove that the Bible's true. All it does is prove that they're wrong. Only the Bible provides what we call the preconditions for the intelligibility of man's experience and reasoning. And that's your technical jargon for the day. Uh, man's experience and reasoning. In order for our reasoning, our, th our thoughts to make sense, in order for our experiences in the universe to be intelligible, to make sense, certain things would have to already be true, and those are what we call those preconditions, the preconditions of intelligibility. And what are some of those things? Well, laws of logic. In order for us to think properly, there would have to already be in existence laws of logic. In order for us to do science, there would already have to be certain things in place. Uh, you already believe that your senses are reliable when you do science. That's a precondition of intelligibility. And so my argument for biblical creation, and for that matter, for any, any portion of the Bible, for the Bible as a worldview, is that uh, it must be true, because if it were not true, you couldn't prove that anything is true. Only the Bible provides those preconditions of intelligibility, and I'm going to spell that out in the rest of the presentation here. There are certain things we rely upon in order to know anything. We rely upon laws of logic, for example, to make thinking possible. We rely upon a certain degree of orderliness in nature, which we'll call uniformity, which, by the way, should not be confused with uniformitarianism. We don't believe in uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is the idea that rates and conditions have been constant throughout time, or more or less. And so a uniformitarianist would say there's never been a worldwide flood because there's not today. Now, I believe conditions change. The Bible tells us conditions change. But the way in which God upholds the universe, what we would call the laws of nature, do not arbitrarily change. Gravity will work the same on Friday as it did on Monday. But conditions, are ch conditions change. It might be raining on Friday and sunny on Monday. Conditions change, but the laws of nature do not arbitrarily change. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about uniformity, like the laws of nature or absolute morality by which, we make, which, by which we make ethical judgments and we know what is right and wrong. In order for us to have those things, the Bible would have to be true because those things are all contingent upon God as revealed in the Scriptures. One, two. Gold Rush. It has everything kids love about VBS and more. This powerful BBS captures the hearts of your children and excites them to uncover the truth about themselves and their Creator. Each day, kids unlock the answers to life's biggest questions about Jesus and themselves using the Scriptures. With Gold Rush, kids will face the most important question Jesus asks, Who do you say that I am? As they blaze a trail into the heart of gold country, they'll uncover exciting Bible discoveries about Jesus. They'll discover his bold claims, learn about his miraculous birth and his radical life. Gold Rush, so much more than your average VBS. Discover the answers in Genesis difference when you order your Super Starter Kit today. To order, call 1-800-778-3390 or visit AnswersVBS.com. Gold Rush, discovering the Rock of Ages. In this era of history, science supposedly has disproved the Bible. Does the radioactive dating of rocks prove that the Earth is very old? Is natural selection the same thing? The dinosaurs... Thing? Why shouldn't you... I don't believe it. Natural selection is not We need to be giving answers to these generations. So how do you form a halo in that time frame? How do we raise the ocean floor? You see, you have to ask the right questions to get the answers. Don't be shocked by that. We've got to grapple with the real